Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 293 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. Brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renner. The show notes are located at my site, continuefit.com. It's also where you can find out more about my book, Be Like the Best, and the Be Like the Best workbook. The book consists of 50 interviews with top fitness professionals, and after each interview is a Be Like, which is just an action step or a challenge that will help you be like the best gotten so much great I'm still getting great feedback from it people still kind of getting around to it you know still buying it and uh, it's just a lot of fun to be part of this process and to help kind of people make an impact on people and help them make an impact so check that out at continuefit.com all right today on the coach's corner with coach Boyle spoke to him about how is the gym going right guys this is an ongoing process things are changing all the time and uh, I just want to see how they're doing, what they're changing. Uh, it's probably going to be something we're going to be talking about into the winter. We also talked about contrast training. Last time we talked about his intro to complexes video, and that led to a discussion on the forum about contrast training and kind of getting bang for your buck in, in what really has to be going back to how's the gym doing and the changes that we've made. They've made some changes uh, with their programming due to time constraints. So Good conversation with Coach Boyle, as always. For the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, did something a little different today. Gave Adam and and Tim the the, the week off or the month off. We're talking to Luke Summers. He's the COO of Power Athlete. If you remember last episode, we had John Wellborn on. He's the CEO from Power Athlete. And we're going to talk. Those guys do an amazing job with their marketplace uh, programs, with their programs just out there for people can buy they're what they what they call in train heroic the team programs so got luke on to talk about some best practices for creating uh really creating an experience really from the start uh there's going to be a two-part series with him don't forget train heroic is what coach will and i use to deliver all of our online training we've been blown away by really how train heroic allows us to connect with our athletes and if you're not using Train Heroic, I don't know what you're waiting for. They just launched plans starting as low as $10 a month, and they have a free 14-day trial. If you mention that I sent you, we're going to put a four-week athlete development program in from Coach Boyle into your account absolutely free. So if you're looking for the best online training solution in the game, go to trainheroic.com. Start your free 14-day trial. For the Functional Movement System segment, Gerald Coopersmith finishes up her three-part series on what to expect when implementing an FMS-based approach at your facility. Today, she talks about empowering your trainers to fully engage with the FMS-based approach. For the Body by Boil online.com, hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment I have on Matthew Ibrahim, and he is the co-owner and director of strength conditioning and the internship coordinator at TD Athletes Edge in Boston spoke to Matthew about the importance of deceleration, landing, and force absorption. That was a lot of our conversation. He actually did a lecture at Coach Boyle's MBSC, and it's on bodybyboyleonline.com. So uh, I wanted to kind of go a little bit deeper with that. We talked about the incidence of lower body injuries in sports as a sign for change within five key body areas. We talked about doing isolated work. Went into the power of language and communication in coaching, and we talked about using social media as an educational platform. I do want to mention Results Fitness. Uh, Last episode was their last episode on the show, and uh, I just wanted to mention it because people might ask, like, hey, where's Alan and Rachel right now? So we're not going to be doing that segment anymore. Uh, They're going to go in a different direction, but I do want to thank them. Wow, over the years, I I, I don't even know if it's been 11 years or 10 years. We've been doing the show for 13. They've been there almost all of the way from the start, and it's been so amazing to have them on. Even Mike Wunsch and Craig Rasmussen, who've been on, who were on in the early days, uh, and Elias Scar, who's, who's kind of come on later on and, and helped with Alan and Rachel do some of those segments. And 
they've really provided so much value. It doesn't mean we're not going to be having them on. They actually, Craig and Alan just wrote a book. We're, I'm waiting for that book to come in the mail. And we're going to, um, we're going to get them on to talk about that. So it's not the end of uh, talking to them, but we're not going to be doing that segment anymore. All right. Well, lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com coaches corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try it out three days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as what's really the best feature on the site, the forum. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day answering questions. Lots of great conversations going all the time. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing good, Ann. How are you? All right. Hanging in there. Um, you know, New York got the news uh, this week. Um, you know, look, there obviously there's going to be restri- lots of restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. But there's light at the end of the tunnel uh, for New York. So I know you guys have been open. We've been talking about this. But I want to keep this going because, look, you know, uh, uh, you know, California's still closed. We're just we're still closed, about to open up next week uh, with restrictions. Uh, Michigan's still closed. Uh, we have a lot of uncertainty, and I wanted to talk to you about that. First of all, how is the gym doing? Are you, are you getting back to really that summer, MS, MBSC summer uh, uh, vibe that you had going on? Or, or how has that been? Um, I I would love to give you a more optimistic answer. We're definitely not at that, you know, that summer vibe, even anything remotely close to it, to be honest. But we are looking at the fall being pretty good. You know, we're starting to see fall signups come in. But but we still have to deal with the realities of uh, social distancing and, you know, limiting amounts of time and all that stuff. So it's I would not say we're out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the good thing is our personal training business has come back really strong. Our sort of early AM adult business has come back pretty good. We still need to be able to to pump that up a little bit more. And a lot of those things, because uh, our, a good percentage of our clients are affluent. So in the summer, we sort of lose a lot of our kind of September to May clients. And then we pick up all these kids in the summer that are training. And so what we need to see is, okay, how, how good is September? Do we get the majority of those people back that we're expecting to be back from wherever, you know, Cape Cod, Vermont, you know, wherever it is that they go for the summer, uh, you know, and can we get, uh, we've talked about this, can we handle athletes every 15 minutes in an hour training session and get that to move smoothly? There's, there's going to be some challenges. Mike, do you feel like the the personal training has come back po- possibly only because I feel like what's what a lot of people have to understand is some people don't want to be around other people right now. There's a small, you know, a small segment. So some people are people who need the, you know, the what you call the check the box clients. They're coming back. They got to check that box. They got to go to a place. They got to see a trainer. Great. They're coming back. Uh, but then there's some people that might say, you know, I don't really want to do the groups anymore. Uh, I like this kind of I'm kind of by myself with my trainer or, you know, what, two other people, one other person, whatever. Um, do you feel like that's part of it with the personal training? Um, I, for us, I don't because it seems to be a lot of the same people. Mm-hmm. And but in some ways, I'm hoping maybe that is the case because one of the things I just did a body by boil online thing with Kevin Larrabee before we did this one, and one of the things I've realized through the process of kind of mm-hmm. analyzing things in this coronavirus time is that, uh, in spite of Thomas Plummer's. Uh, Prediction: One-on-one training is not even close to dead. At least not at my boil strength and conditioning. <laughs> in terms of, it's about forty-five percent of our revenue when we started to look at it. And so, that's a big thing in terms of can we get that piece of our revenue back? And that looks like that's going to be the most easily restored piece because it's the one that's least limited by kind of social distance and a lot of the other things. Uh, anytime we start putting people in groups, it, it creates a larger problem. So it's we've got to be able to do that. Then we've got to look at that other 55% of the revenue and say, let, let's just say we split that and say it's, you know, 
27% kids and 27% adults, you know, training in groups, then we've got to be able to get those groups in and through and processed and have the quality of the product be high. Um, that's easy to do for the adults, but we have to, again, with our adults, we're limited to eight, just like we are with everything else. And so we're at the same situation where we've got to add groups and add times to get more people in. Whereas before we might have, you know, the nine o'clock adult group might have 20 people in. That would not be unusual on, you know, on a good day that 20 people show up for that group. That can't happen anymore. We've gone to more of the, uh, we use AFS for signups and stuff, but it's that for people would be more familiar with like the mind body idea of you can sign up until the slots are gone. Yeah. So there's eight slots. And when the eight slots are filled, then the eight slots are filled and you don't, you can't sign up. You've got to pick a different time. So, uh, we've got to see, do, you know, are there like, you know, like for instance, we're starting at five fifteen. We've got a 515. I think we've got a 545. And I think we've got a, even a 615 and a 645. If we can get those groups to be eight people and have those groups be both Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday, then again, we're in a pretty good spot because, you know, now we've got uh, 64 adult clients that we know we're, we're taking care of during the course of those two days. And, you know, then we start looking at like our, you know, our normal eight, and nine o'clock adult groups. You know, we might get back up, you know, I, and I don't know what our adult number is in terms of, okay, how many of these year round adult, like, uh, small group clients do we actually have? Like, what was our peak number? But we've got to be able to look at that number and we've got to try to get back to that. So for us, this will probably be the first year we've ever been really numbers oriented. In the past, it was always just get the quality of the product high. And everything else will take care of itself. Mike, but, just oh, go ahead. yeah, look, no, look into the future and um, the immediate future. Really, um, it seems like not, not that you're fragile, but like obviously, it's all these. There's all these little things that that it's dependent upon. Okay, if we can do this, if we can do that, but with possibility of kids going to school and then then they say okay they're not going to school. How does that kind of affect what you guys are doing? Could that be? not devastating, but could that be a huge monkey wrench? Because then parents might have to stay home, their schedule changes, kids' schedule changes. How does that possibly affect you? Um, I don't think that's going to affect us as drastically as anything else, because if anything, I think it will be a positive, because it will mean we could be busy all day, potentially. Because what we're looking at now, so let's, I'll give you a for instance, we've added back our nine o'clock adult group in, in the winter. So in the fall rather. So in September, there'll be a nine adult group that pushes our pro group to nine 30. That then pushes our next, so whatever that next group is, is going to say be 10 o'clock at 10 o'clock. We might have college kids again, because there's a lot of college kids that are going to defer. So we might have, you know, college men at 10 and college women at 10 30. And those would be the kind of groups that we didn't have during the school year last year. And then if we did get kids who are, let's just say that, you know, if kids are all remote, I think that the only thing that it might do is open up a little bit of a block, say one to three, where kids could get in earlier than they normally could, because the way at least, you know, where our town in particular, that when they are remote, they'll be done, I think by 1230 or one, when they're in school, they're in school till three. So, I think in most ways it will be helpful. I don't think that it will hurt. We have not found situations where parents are struggling to get kids to the gym. You know, people are figuring out carpools and how to get mm -hmm. kids there and all that stuff with no problem at all. The bigger problem that we have are the parents looking over our shoulder and we've talked about this, but you know, in terms of masks and cleaning and groups and distancing and all of that stuff. But uh, I think, and particularly because where we're going to be, there's going to be a combination. You have some kids that are going to go all remote. You have some kids that may, I don't think we'll have many that will be in school full time in our particular area, but we'll have a lot of hybrids and some of the hybrids will be different. Our Reading hybrid where we live won't help us because the kids will be in school every other week the way that it's going to work. So my son will be in school for a week and then will be remote for a week. 
we can't really schedule groups based on that, so it doesn't help us. But if someone else's school was more in you know, a situation of where they knew they were always going to be done earlier during the day or something like that, then we might actually benefit in some way from that in terms of just opening up more slots. Because realistically, come September, our gym is going to be very quiet from 11 o'clock until 4 o'clock just based on the fact that there aren't a lot of available clients here. There'll be personal training people in there, but that's about it. The good thing about that is I think if we do a better job, we may be able to get back some of our older clients who've been more resistant to coming. You know, if we said to people, hey, you can come 12 to one, and we can pretty much guarantee you that there's gonna be eight people in the gym, then that may bring some of those people back yeah. in. So yeah. was, we've got a lot of, um, a lot of things to work on, a lot of things to consider, a lot of different kind of marketing angles. You know, it's sort of like now, you know, you can you can senior citizen shop from six to seven at Stop and Shop to, to try to make it, you know, safer. We may end up saying basically, hey, you know, we've got uh, older adult hours from 12 to two, and we're gonna limit the number of people in the gym to 10 or 12 or 20, you know what I mean, whatever number we decide. I like that. Well, you know, so there'll there'll be a lot of ways I think to to play into some of these things. Mike, how does it affect you? And I was thinking about this today. I don't know what made me think of it, but like your intern program and and how reliant you know sometimes you can be on interns. Well, it affected our intern program greatly this summer in the sense that we did not take it. Um, so that was and that was because when we initially started out the governor's mandate basically was that we could have, I think it was, it might've been 10 people in a group, including the instructor. Mm -hmm. But if you had two instructors, you could only have eight people. We only had room for eight anyway, so we could have had two people with each group based on, you know, on that particular guideline, but we didn't. But now I think that the fall comes, I think a lot of those kind of guidelines will get relaxed and we'll be able to have, you know, we, we can easily have two people with each group, which means we can have interns. So we're in the process. We're going to take interns for the fall and uh, and kind of get back, get that back up and running. And the other thing that's happening is I think there's a – because it is all – there has been a little bit of relaxation on the um, – you know, on some of – I think some of the more absurd rules – so I think that's a good thing because, like, for a while, they, you know, the staff wasn't supposed to be in the staff offices. They were supposed to leave the premises if they, uh, you know, when they were done working. And, you know, I don't think people are as worried about that. I think what people are worried about, and uh, I was reading an article yesterday in the magazine, and, you know, people want to see what the magazine called Corona Theater. And they were talking about, you know, they want to see cleaning and scrubbing and paper towels and, you know, they want to smell bleach and they – you know what I mean? If, if they get all of that, then I think they're going to be okay in terms of feeling comfortable, you know, being at the gym and doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even a lot of, a lot of gyms have gone to, you know, I see Frank Nash doing Frank. show and every, every time he's got his, uh, you know, Ghostbusters crew come in and spray everything yeah. right. I mean, that's, it's the optics there. So yeah, that's Corona theater. You know, yeah. you've got to have, People got to see it. Like, I want to know that, you know, like even today I went around, you know, I got done with my client and I went around and I wiped down everything that we touched. And it was funny because then one, Joe Maloney, one of the kids that works for us, he goes, yeah, it's really funny. You know, we clean the medicine balls. Then we pick the medicine balls up with our hands and put them back where we got them. You know, and it's like, I know. And then should you clean them again? Like, you know, I put them against the, you know, it's like, you know, there's no way to be touchless in our environment, but. The one thing that was interesting was that and this was what the, uh, the magazine article was talking about, that the surface transmission thing is another one of the many kind of Corona myths, you know, things that have been overblown. There isn't a significant, you know, surface transmission is not a huge thing. It, it may be obviously, you know, not let's not minimize, but at the same time, they don't think that people are getting, you know, coronavirus off doorknobs or countertops or, you know, dumbbell handles or things like that. So 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely Absolutely. heard that too. Coach, we talked about your intro to Complex's video last episode, only mostly because I was asking you as it it seems like it'll be a nice bang for your buck piece. And the conversation, the thread on traincoach.com got into what you called complex training, another kind of complex training, which some people call contrast training, which basically combining a strength power exercise with a jump or throw, et cetera. Um, and, you know, you really like that. And and you said you were possibly going to try them today with your sophomore group, but have you done any, uh, any playing around with them? Because again, that is a way to kind of, you know, work on some strength, work on some power and speed. And, and like what I like about, I said in the thread was that I feel like my, my guys have given me the feedback of this. They feel like it's just, it's an athletic, a more athletic session uh, throughout the whole thing. Like they're lifting, they're jumping, they're, uh, they're throwing the balls throughout the whole session. So have you, tr- have you played around with this at all? During this? We put that phase in this week and I like it. I'm hoping, I'm wishing that somebody would comment. My issue with it is, can you do that forever or does the benefit of it go away? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you, is there that sort of said principle adaptation where you cease to benefit from the combination of whatever strength, power, you know, weight exercise, jump exercise, you know, weight exercise, throw exercise, because I really like it to be honest. And the athletes really like it. Uh, I, well, the, why, why do you feel like we talked the, about, um, you know, clean front squat, whatever. I was going to try that today and I didn't basically because I forgot. And, uh, but I do need to go back and see as we get a little more pressed for time, like, okay, how do these guys look? You know, how do these kids that are doing it look? Because they should be at the point where they're capable, but I haven't tried it. So I, I need to, I always think sometimes I don't try things because I'm afraid of change and I'll be the first to admit just, you know, I think I'm critical of other people for that. And maybe because I know it's a failing of my own, but that's something that we've got to kind of, I don't know, work on. Yeah. I don't understand why you feel like it, why, why it would, the benefit would, would just end if, if you know, okay, you're, 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 you know, then you're saying that why aren't, why the plyometrics, why, you know, did the benefit end there? And, you know, like, does the benefit end with a, a the same idea with a med ball? So I think, you know, just depending on, like I said, I do it once a week uh, in season, a lot closer to the event. So if the guys are playing over the weekend, you know, fr- starting Friday night, then Saturday, whatever, then I might do that workout on a Thursday. They feel good. They feel athletic. They feel like they got something in without me destroying them. But I feel like, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's the same idea. Like, well, why, you know, we're going to keep going with plyometrics. And also, I feel like it's the same thing what you used to say about working with the senior population. If if we're just staying the same, are we really get, aren't we really getting better? Because normally we're decreasing like a certain small percentage every year in strength and power. So if we can maintain that throughout those years, are, is that really getting better? So to me, it's a similar idea. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I, but I, and I, um, I think I'm very self critical at times. I can definitely fall into the, this is the way we've always done it kind of rhythm. And, struggle to get out of that rhythm, which is why I changed it. Like I said, I hadn't done like, you know, my sophomore group has basically been doing kind of a pretty similar program all summer. Like, you know, it's more of a conventional program. Let's put it that way. And, uh, and I was like, well, why aren't I letting them complex? And some of it is cause you know, it's just more, uh, you know, it's, it's more logistical, you know, it's more demonstration. It's more, you know, because we're always trying to keep them corralled. And the difference for us, I think, with this summer more than any other that's made it difficult is we've had to spend a lot more energy on distancing and on getting people, you know, stay in your lane, stay in your pod, put your mask back on. So when you kind of add another layer in, it I guess it gives you an excuse not to add another layer in. Let me put it that way. And, and that's why I changed it because I'm like, oh, I think that's just me you know, making it, making things more difficult than they should be. Let's just, 
try it and see what happens. And it actually was fine. It worked out great the last two days, <laughs> which is yeah. also usually what happens. Yeah, good stuff. All right, Coach, we'll let you go. Thanks for doing this, and we will speak to you next time. Anthony, thank you very much, as always. All right, hey, guys, remember, at Perform Better, they got the free summer seminar series for everyone. And basically, it's live presentations plus Q&A sessions. I actually am going this week, Thursday, the 27th, August 27th, at 2 o'clock. Uh, their CEU is available. I am doing seven things I learned from the best of the best. Basically, what I learned from doing my book uh, with the 50 interviews in Be Like the Best. So... Um, we'll have a link for that. Just go to Perform Better, I mean, because it's all over the front page, but I'll also have a link for that in the show notes, so make sure you check that out at performbetter.com. Hope to see you there. All right, guys, now it's time for the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment. And so we got a little something different today. Uh, I gave uh, Tim and Adam the week off. I'm here with Luke Summers. He's the CEO of Power Athlete. No. A lot of you guys will remember if you listened to last week's show, we had John Wellborn on. John's the CEO of uh, of the Power Athletes. So, Luke, thanks for doing this. You got it, man. Excited to be here. All right. Well, you know, it's funny because I was talking to Josh uh, Sutra a while back, and when I was putting up my golf programs, and I, you know, I was just, just starting. I was like, hey, how's this going to work? And how's do it? And he said, Dude, just go to Power Athlete and see how they're doing it. And so <laughs> that's why I was when I was talking to Tex, I was like, hey, you know, you guys, can we get somebody on to talk about best practices? Because I think, I think, you know, number one, we got we got a lot of people to understand, hey, this is the next step. You got to get into yeah. some online training. But this is such a great little um, uh, uh, additional revenue stream because we already have the Train Relic app. I'm doing some some uh, some training, some programming for for clients. So you know whether they're on just online or some people that are coming in. But then this is right. another great way. And you guys have nine programs on there. So if I'm gonna get into this, um, what is really what what do I need to think about? What are some things that I really want to go and say? I got to make sure I do these three, five, whatever, these things to be successful in the train rock marketplace. Sure. Sure. I, you know, what's, what's interesting is, man, there's a lot of stinky, filthy, dark corners to this internet. And if you snoop around enough, you can find sets, reps, movement selections, loading programs, weeks, blah, 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 right. The technical components of training anywhere for free. So you got to create an experience that's worth paying for. And I think that that comes with a little bit of knowing who you are and what you can offer. So when I say experience, when someone's coming, you know, you almost, if you ran, if you've ever ran a gym or ran a, a weight room, you have a culture there. You have your core values. Those things need to be front and center. When individuals come to sign up or potentially shop around on your, uh, your landing page, it needs to be structured to let them know what the heck they might be in for. So you got to tell them why they need to trust you to solve whatever problem they have. So you need an audience and you need to know that audience. So there's some legwork ahead of this, whether it's a podcast like this, Anthony, whether it's a blog, whether it's your social media account, you need to hustle. You need to put content out there. You need to get some followers so that you can tell somebody about the programming that you're offering. Absolutely. And, and so what, talk, talk a little bit more about creating that experience. Cause okay. I got my, like you said, I got my sets and reps. That's the easy part for, for all my listeners, for sure. Right. Uh, the landing right. page could be pretty easy because, you know, like, like, let's just say for the most part, you can do a, a pretty easy land landing page on Wix. Also, Train Heroic does give yeah, you yeah. a page as well. Not like what you guys have, but they either allow you to put a video sure. on there, et cetera. So how are you creating that experience when they're coming to that landing page? It, it comes with the brand, I guess, Anthony, and this could be like kind of the hard part, right? We, so Power Athlete is a, a strength and conditioning program that has goal-oriented programming. So each of our programs have a cool and catchy and punchy name that's associated with the goal of the individual who would be signing up for it, whether it's Field Strong, Jack Street, Grindstone, Lean and Able, man, you know, and then X, Y, and Z through the rest of that, that catalog. So you need to be able to effectively communicate that. So, you know, your niche is golf. We need to understand the psychology of golfers and what the what are their pain points and problems. And then you need to find creative ways to say that 
uh, to, to communicate how you're going to be solving that without them having to sign up yet. So they need to, uh, and you're probably going to have to give that away on that content stream or whatever that content strategy you have, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or, you know, TikTok or whatever the heck's around, you know, whatever your customers are on or your clients are on, you need to start giving that content away. And it, that, that experience needs to be congruent and continuous through this like, kind of cold and warming up phase where they just kind of find you. Then when they go to their landing page, they should see similar visuals and similar language. And then when they sign up, they should be welcomed with an email or a direct message from that same tone of voice. And everything should be a pretty concierge with getting them started because the big thing in this space, you have two, two options in terms of um, this online training space. There's this one time one-stop shop, fixed length program approach where you can say, Hey, I got a 12 week program. If you want to, you know, get bigger pecs or whatever. Right. Um, it's called Pecosaurus Rex. And, or you have a team like Jack street where that's a continual stream of training. Then the next step is to make sure that you're structuring that training. So anyone could join at any time frictionless. There's no specific start date. They can start on a Tuesday. It can start on a Friday and that you have content served to them when they sign up that explains that. So that's like kind of this onboarding process. So you got to be able to, to build a landing page, have a content strategy that is out there to acquire new, new clients or customers uh, or athletes. And then you need to be able to structure your programming, which may deviate from your core principles. If you ever ran a weight room (laughs) or like worked with a a cohort of athletes in an off season, it's probably going to deviate from a lot of those best practices because you don't have the luxury of seeing these people, knowing they're going to be there um, on these specific days and, and knowing that they're going to start on this day, right? So um, you got to also structure your program for retention. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. I think you hit the nail on the head right there as to what's been the barrier for entry for a lot of strength coaches is they they they're they don't want to let go of mm-hmm. some of those those i don't know i let's call them big rocks right now that you like you're talking about just like it's, it's, it might not look like it did in your gym in your weight room but it's okay mm-hmm. you're still giving them some really good content and you're delivering uh, uh what you know what you do best so that's right very cool. I want to get you on next episode. Let's. Uh, so we're going to end here. I really appreciate you coming on, but I want to just talk about, for the next episode, I want to talk about just creating, like once that person signs up, I want to, I want to do some best practices. So Luke, okay. thanks so much for coming on. Welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. I'm Geraldine Coopersmith, and today I'll be presenting part three of a three-part series on what to expect when implementing an FMS-based approach in your facility. In part one, I spoke about dealing with trainer resistance and getting trainer buy-in. Last time in part two, I spoke about the importance of getting management and inter-organizational buy-in. Today, in the final segment of this series, I'd like to talk about empowering your trainers to fully engage with an FMS-based approach. In previous corporate roles at Equinox and Nike, I was fortunate enough to be involved in large-scale rollouts of an FMS-based approach to training. I've seen programs be either successful or challenged based on their ability to do several things. Shift trainer orientation from muscles to movements, highlight a neurodevelopmental thought process, and encourage trainers to use the tools and knowledge that they already have. Many trainers, particularly those starting out in their careers, think of the body from a reductionist point of view with a focus on training individual muscles. One key to creating a lasting culture where FMS can take root is to continually educate your trainers on how the body is not a collection of individual muscles, but a fully integrated unit. Educating your teams on frameworks like Greg Cook and Michael Boyle's joint by joint approach to highlight regional interdependence or Tom Meyer's anatomy trains work to show that muscles don't work in isolation begins to shift trainer orientation from the body being a collection of parts to seeing the body as a complex and cohesive structure. This approach helps trainers shift their orientation from training muscles to improving movement. As you focus trainers on this approach, they begin to understand their role in facilitating the improvement of postures and patterns versus stressing specific muscles. Another important concept that helps your trainers really take ownership of an FMS-based approach is educating and reinforcing the idea of a neurodevelopmental approach to movement. 
most trainers don't have much training or exposure on how we learn to move initially as children. And more important, they don't understand how that original movement roadmap can be a vehicle to improve the way adults move today. We know that babies initially learn to move by going through highly predictable developmental stages. They start in foundational positions, supine or prone, gradually having enough motor control to advance to transitional positions such as crawling or kneeling, and finally to functional positions such as a bilateral stance, split stance, single leg stance, and ultimately progression, progressing to locomotion and the manipulation of objects. This neurodevelopmental framework provides trainers with a thought process where they can start to determine the next logical step in a client's progression by looking at the client's last point of success. For example, if a client is struggling with a standing position, how are we regressing it to a transitional position such as tall or half kneeling or regressing it further to a supine or prone position to get a client to a place where they can authentically work through their movement barrier, the edge between their last point of success and their first point of failure to gradually improve their movement control and competency. Dr. Greg Rose's 4x4 matrix is an excellent resource for providing a checklist that trainers can run through when they're trying to determine appropriate next steps to improve a specific movement pattern in terms of both position and load. And lastly, while it's important to expose your trainers to the FMS library of correctives, it's perhaps more important to empower them to create their own correctives as long as there's a thought process behind it. That thought process should be informed by the idea of training movements, not muscles, using the neurodevelopmental sequence so our clients are reteaching themselves on how to move because of the environmental challenges that we as coaches and trainers are providing for them. The key here is that if you focus on having the trainers use the FMS correctives without understanding the rationale and thought process behind those exercises, it becomes very difficult to create sustainable cultural change. Trainers become focused on the what without understanding the why. This ultimately results in trainers backsliding and defaulting to what they know and feel comfortable doing. We've all heard the expression, give a man to fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. By giving trainers frameworks and freedom to interpret those into correctives in ways that make sense to them, we allow them to use and build on their existing skill set. Gradually, they'll be able to feel a greater sense of personal ownership and self-efficacy in the FMS methodology. Over time, they'll also have a better understanding of the FMS correctives, having worked through this thought process on their own. If you try to push an arsenal of new exercises on trainers, on top of them having to learn to administer and score an FMS screen, you risk overwhelming your team, undermining their confidence, and reducing the chance of creating a sustainable cultural shift in how your trainers program. An FMS-based approach to movement can be a powerful tool that radically improves the quality of the training you're providing your members while also upskilling your teams. But the approach only works if you find ways to empower your trainers by meeting them where they are today, giving them new frameworks to expand their knowledge, and giving them permission to explore and be creative within those structures. Don't let a quest for perfection overwhelm you or your team and thwart your efforts to move your facility from one where trainers are focusing on muscles to one where they're focusing on improving and training human movement. By helping trainers use the tools they have to implement a new thought process, you dramatically increase the success of implementing an FMS-based approach in your facility. I'm Geraldine Coopersmith, and that's it for part three of my three-part series on what to expect when implementing an FMS-based approach in your facility. Thanks so much for listening. For more information, please check out functionalmovement.com. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle online.com. Hit the gym with the strength coach segment. Become an insider to Mike Boyle's strength conditioning with staff meetings, in services, and complete access to the MBSC program. Check it out at bodybyboyleonline.com. All right, today I have, now this is long overdue, Coach Matthew. Ibrahim and I, I had to ask about about the name because it's you know, it's a tough one. Ibrahim, um, he serves as the co-owner, director of strength and conditioning, internship coordinator. He's probably the sanitizer director as well at this point at TD Athletes <laughs> Edge in Boston. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor professor at Maryville University and Endicott College. In addition to being a PhD student at Rocky Mountain University in the Human and Sport Performance Program, as a public 
public speaker. He's provided presentations at Google, Stanford University, and Equinox, in addition to speaking at several of the NSCA conferences and clinics. And as a writer, his articles have been featured in some of the world's largest publications, such as Men's Health, Men's Fitness, Men's Journal, and T Nation. Check out his Instagram. We'll have links to that on uh, at my page on the show note page at continuefit.com. Matt, thanks for doing this, bud. Yeah, thanks for having me on, brother. I've been uh, I've been listening to this podcast <laughs> since its uh, birth, and it's, uh, it's I truly appreciate you having me on, brother. All right, yeah, this is a long, like I said, long time coming, and and I definitely should have had you. You know, reminded me. I know we're gonna the first topic we're gonna talk about is the importance of deceleration landing and force absorption. I know you did this this lecture. Speaking of the body by boy online.com, hit the gym with the train coat segment. You you did this for Mike and uh the staff at MBSC. And that's where I kind of said, oh, I gotta get Matthew on and and finally get mm-hmm. this done. Uh, because I think this is a, such an important topic. And you know, you in, in one of your articles that you wrote about this, you were talking about how we spend so much time uh up front on the skills of acceleration, force production, and jumping mechanics without ever spending quality time on their respective counterparts. What are their respective counterparts? And talk to us. uh, Let's get this going. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I look at it like you're conducting business, right? And so when you're in the, when you're in the gym, in the performance center, we talk about, we have to weigh risk versus reward. What is the, how can I maximize someone's performance while reducing the likelihood of injury? So I look at it like a business transaction. The first order of business, in my opinion, is to master the skills of deceleration, so slowing down, landing mechanics, so basically self-organization of your body as you come back down from, from jumping, and then force absorption. So that may be absorbing contact. Let's say you're playing basketball, you jump up for a rebound. Someone kind of bumps into your shoulder, you absorb that contact, and then you also land on the ground with both feet in a nice organized fashion. That to me would be the, you know, the first order of business. Let's check off these boxes first. Once we have built those really nice deceleration skills, landing mechanics, and force absorption skills, let's really refine our technical abilities to accelerate, so speed up, so build speed, quickness, jump in mechanics, the amount of force production, also the rate of force uh, development, and then how quickly and explosively can we produce that force. So that's kind of how I view it. And I think oftentimes this, this kind of this chart, if you will, may get looked at as, well, Matt, are you saying that we should only do deceleration first before we do acceleration? I'm not necessarily saying that. What I am saying that is most people skip the first order business, business altogether, and and they just go right to the sexy stuff. Okay, let me let me scroll on IG. Let me see how how high of a box up I can do. Let me watch one of those videos. Let me see how you know how far or how how horizontally far I can do a broad jump. And those things are awesome. We need those. They're so crucial. But if we don't build the foundation, which is deceleration, force absorption, landing mechanics first, those the second order of business, the acceleration, the sexy stuff, the speed. They won't look as nice, and you also won't have the ability to pump the brakes as quickly. I liken this to the sport of hockey, uh, Mighty Ducks. You have Mendoza, the fastest guy on the ice, bar none. He could never slow down. He clearly did not check off the first order of business uh, boxes first and foremost. Absolutely, and and you know there is that saying, uh, you're never gonna really express your full speed potential if you don't have those breaks. Yep. Um, now talk to me about, um, also, I love what you were talking about that there's, and I, I couldn't figure it out before about, you know, the, uh, the canary, the canary analogy. Uh, and the- <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, these are the things, the incidence of lower body injuries in sports as a sign for change within five key body areas. So we're seeing all of these lower body injuries in sports. And we have to understand that, you know, this might be the underlying cause is not really truly working on, you know, the deceleration, the landing mechanics and uh, absorbing force. What are those injuries? So we're seeing a lot. I mean, there's a ton of research out there. Obviously, if you really wanted to, you could try to fix things. But I think we can all agree that there's there are five key areas where we see a high incidence in athletics and sporting endeavors 
where injuries occur. So let's look at the calf region, and I'm just going to give a general umbrella term that explains some of the derivatives that within. So the calf region, right? So you have the Achilles tendon, the almighty Achilles tendon, right? And you have it, it, it's, its best friends. You have gastroc, so the big calf muscle, the one that pops out when you flex when you're standing up. And then we have the often forgot about soleus, where you have to be in a, in a, in a knee bent or a seated position to really let that shine from a training standpoint, from a loading standpoint. So we have soleus, we have gastrocnemius, and so we have the Achilles tendon. Let's not forget about the, the front, so the anterior tibialis and the perineal, some of those other muscles as well, because they get often ignored. So, I, you know, something that I always think of and it is how often are you directly training the lower limb, a.k.a. the calf, the gastroc, the soleus, the tibialis anterior, the shin muscle, the perineals, the Achilles tendon. I would argue, I'm sorry, I would question that there's probably a lot of strength coaches, performance coaches, uh, even in the rehab realm, athletic trainers or PTs out there who don't really spend enough time properly developing this area. When you jump and when you land, what is the first part of the body that, that touches the ground upon jumping and landing? It's the same area, that foot, ankle, calf complex. So that's, that's crucial. Then you kind of travel up the chain and look at the knee. The knee is often a place where people don't realize that there are two major tendons uh, associated with the knee, the patella tendon and the quadriceps tendon. So from a tendon loading standpoint, Something as basic as, you know, put yourself in. If you can't put yourself back in the high school basketball, you guys just got, um, you know, ran out of the building the night before, you guys lost, it's the next day of practice. What did the coach have you guys do? All right, guys, hit the wall. We're doing a wall sit. At the time, we're like, this is, cr- this is nonsense. What am I doing? But now if you look at, through some of the research from a, an analgesic effect, whether you're kind of rehabilitating, also just from a, a general muscle pump effect, also from the ability of someone with quote unquote cranky knees to withstand a flexed knee position with back support. Whereas if they didn't have support uh, in a squatting or knee flex position, they probably couldn't do it. So isometrics are really cool, are really cool in my opinion for knee health, whether it's you're just strengthening the knee, generally speaking, the, some of the quad muscles, you're strengthening, you know, whether it's the patella tendon, the quad tendon, Providing some sort of knee health benefit, and we're going to jump into some of the uh, re- reverse Nordic curls or the reverse Nordic cancer uh, exercises uh, from the research that can really benefit the knee uh, strengthening and the functionality of the knee. And then everyone's favorite, hamstring strength. Everyone has seen all of the research uh, from the Nordic hamstring curls and you know how beneficial that can be. I still think there's not enough research out there talking about the specific progressions, regressions, and lateralizations of a Nordic hamstring curl, because I don't know about you, but I have actually never seen, uh, other than the, I can't remember his name, uh, Tyree Kill, other than the receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs on Instagram, I've never really seen someone in person perform, you know, a set of six to eight clean, pristine Nordic hamstring curl reps. They're really challenging to do, and only someone with really well-developed posterior chain and hamstring muscles can really do them. So my, my curiosity lends itself to, I'd love to see an actual full progression from start to finish on how to build a Nordic, but look at the hamstrings, you know, you have grade one through three uh, strains. People often forget about the hamstring, uh, the proximal hamstring tendon as well, which, you know, the hammy muscles connect to the uh, ischial tuberosity, AKA the sit bone. So we forget about, that hamstring region from a loading standpoint, it's, and it's not just the curls, it's the eccentrics, it's the, the long bridges or the long arc bridges. We'll talk about that um, as well. And that, that's a, that's a, become a really big favorite of mine. A lot of good research on that as well. And then the neighbor of the hamstring is the groin region. So the adductor, the, the you know, medial or inside thigh. And there's, again, there's a lot of good research on Copenhagen plank in the research, how beneficial it can be from some medial knee strengthening and inner groin. And again, that's another thing where we know Copenhagen plank can be helpful, but again, I've yet to see uh, some research and maybe out there. I'm, I'm not the most uh, sciencey person out there. I only force myself to look at some research because of my doctorate degree that I'm after right now. But again, there, there are people way more intelligent than me in this realm, but I've yet to see an article or articles or a systematic review where 
we're looking at all of the progressions and variations from an exercise standpoint, the Copenhagen plank. But again, there are so many other ways to load the adductors, whether it's a sideline, uh, bottom leg lift, or a standing adductor squeeze. There's so many great ways to do it. And then you have to look at the hip flexor region. And the reason I didn't put low back on here is because hip flexor is commonly, uh, you know, associated with low back stuff or lumbo pelvic issues. So is the groin and the hamstring just based on their origin and insertion points. So the hip flexor, another reason where, you know, and someone comes up to you and says, oh man, my hips are tight. How often do we say, yeah, yeah, go stretch, go stretch, go stretch. We know that, sure, neurologically, that may quote unquote, feel good and they give them a good sensation it may alleviate for a short period of time but we also know that it's not going to help the longevity of that hip flexor region from a strengthening standpoint so oftentimes when someone says go stretch your hips your hip flexors i'm not inherently against that but i don't think it's the it's the, the most efficient and best bang for your buck rather let's strengthen that area via some, you know, mini band sprinter exercises, whether you're in a long position or a 90-90 position, whether it's just performing, you know, basic uh, standing hip flexor exercise. There's so many great things out there. But in my opinion, these five regions, hip flexor, knee, groin, hamstring, and calf are often ignored in an overall strength and conditioning training program, especially from an isolated standpoint. Yes, someone will argue, well, we're doing lateral lunges. Yes. You're going to get some groin there. You may even get some knee as well, but are you isolating in the area the same way you would, you know, you look at baseball players, oh, we're doing arm care. We're doing arm care. One of the reasons why Eric Christie has become so popularized because, you know, he specializes in that area for baseball players. Well, what about, what about lower body care? What about knee care? What about groin care? What about hip flexor care, handy care, calf care? It's the same thing in my opinion. So I really believe that we have to begin to load these areas more to reduce to reduce the rate of injury to increase our ability to have stronger you know structural support systems aka the muscle the muscles the tendons the ligaments the bones so we can then the sexy stuff now decelerate and then accelerate yeah I, I want to stay on this topic really quick just because I like let's go over some of those things the calf let's go back to the calf sure. I am guilty of this I got a couple of hockey players have been training uh, and one of the things that we were doing is on leg day, we we just and I just because I was trying to make it easy, I only I'm guilty. I only did standing calf raises, so I did add that, but I wasn't adding the seated calf raise. Or, so I and obviously I understand. You know we have to get the soleus as well. But you were talking about the sure. front muscles. Will that seated position work the front muscles a little more? You certainly could. I mean, and that, that's the big key. You certainly could get it standing or seated for you know the front muscles or the shin, the shin splint area, yeah. uh, tibialis anterior. I'm a big fan of. So there's one. Let's say your your back is to the wall, right? Your butt, your your entire back, your butt's on the wall. You walk your feet out about six to eight inches in front of you, and you put you place your palms on the wall. From there, keep your feet flat. Now raise your toes to your face and back down flat. Try that. Try that for 10 reps. You'll be astonished at, at how effective that is in terms of working the front of your shin muscles. It, it, I mean, you can, you know, we call the, we call, so that's like a wall, you know, wall leaning tibialis, toe raise. There's other variations we talk about. We call the penguin walk. So stand up tall, uh, you, you know, elevate your toes up toward your face, tip them up to the side to really target tibialis interior and then go for, kind of go for a, not a walk, but a waddle. And that's another way to get them. You could certainly, in a seated position, let's say you're sitting on, let's call it a 24-inch firebox. You talk about seated or knee bent, and you have a kettlebell uh, perform better cells. It's it's not the regular kettlebell sold by Rogue. It's the one where the kettlebell is a wide bar, so your foot can fit all the way underneath. And even if you don't need anything heavy, I'm talking like 10, 15 pounds, to the point where if you're seating on a 24-inch box, your foot does not touch the ground. You loop a kettlebell around one foot, and you let it kind of dangle to the bottom and then raise your toe to your face. That's a nice way where you could address that anterior tibialis or that shin muscle in a seated position. Love it. Now, um, I want to go to um, the knee. I, you had mm -hmm. posted in your article the tall kneel fallback. And I, I'll be honest, I couldn't really understand the benefit 
other than what mm-hmm. it looked like more of a stretch. So talk to me about, can you explain the total kneel fallback for everybody? And then what, what is this helping with? Absolutely. Yeah. So this one has been popularized in the research. They, they refer to it as reverse Nordic curl. Some other research articles talk about the reverse Nordic hamstring exercise. So you'll see that in kind of both variations. And it, it, it's some of the research talks about, you know, how it increases muscle fascia length or muscle thickness or the cross-sectional area of the quads, all these kind of sciencey terms. But I look at it as a way to how can I achieve tolerable, tolerable ranges of knee flexion? Think of the position, right? So let's say, let's say, let's take exercise, throw out the window for a moment. Let's say you're playing with your kids and, you know, they're on the ground. So you have to go to the ground. Do you half nail? Do you tall nail? Do you kind of lay on your side? So one of the positions where, where I say where I think it's really beneficial for long-term health is adequate knee flexion range of motion and kind of gapping that knee joint is, is, is it comfortable. So, you know, let's say you're, you're on your knees and you let your, so you don't take your toes and vertically put them into the ground. Instead, you let the laces of your feet kind of just kiss the ground. How far can you sit back comfortably? I, I, would, I would guess that a lot of people probably can't do this comfortably, especially if you're older, especially if you had any sort of knee pathologies, uh, knee tendinopathies, or just a cranky or pissed off knee, or maybe knee surgeries. So this position, this tall nail position, we like to start it by, okay, let's start by doing, you know, let's say you're standing up tall, about a foot, a foot and a half from a wall, your hands are on a wall, or your hands are supported by a barbell rack, something where there's support. And you let your knees gently dip toward the ground. You, you don't touch the ground. Maybe you stop at a you know two to three uh, air expat stacked up, and then you come back up. It's kind of a regression of a you know you know you see this kind of uh, not in the research but on YouTube or exercise channels a quote unquote sissy squat. Yeah. Maybe you yeah. start there first because yes, you're putting the knee into an accentuated degree of flexion but you're not necessarily loading it as heavily as you would in a tall nail fall back, fall back or a reverse Nordic core. Uh, start there. Then once you kind of adapt it and gain some tolerance, there's some tissue tolerance, some joint loading tolerance, and tendon, tendon loading tolerance, let's go to the tall nail fall back. So set up in a tall nail position. I like to start with the Eric's pad. And as you know, the uh, general Eric's pad is about like, I don't know if it's a half an inch, three fourths of an inch or an inch, somewhere where there's a little bit of separation. If you put your knees on it and then your toes off of it on the ground, your toes vertical to the ground. Now you have a little bit of space to use your toes as a, as a stopper, so to speak. So the biggest thing is staying nice and rigid in your torso. You have a straight line I can draw from your knees through your hips, through your shoulders. The same thing we're looking for in a Nordic hamstring curl where we're not trying to dump the trunk in, in front of us. So you're just going to come back as, as slowly and as controlled as you can. This should elicit a bit of a quote-unquote stretch on the quad region, the knee region, the region, the tendons. That entire area should kind of light up like a Christmas tree and then slowly come back up. That eccentric control of the lowering portion is the money maker. That's where we get the most gains, if you will, because that slow eccentric loading of that area allows for that muscle growth and that development of the, 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 the structural strengthening of the tendons and the associated joint in the knee. So that's why, I mean, this is kind of what the research talks about is why it's, it's so important to not only get it from a, from a development standpoint, from the structural support systems, but also I look at it like, well, long-term, just longevity. What are the things I want to see? I want to see someone be able to just kind of do a deep squat naturally I want to see someone be able to kind of go into some deep end range flexion. Again, we want this to be tolerable. We don't want to force feed it. And I like to see someone put their arm up and up over their head, like basic human functions that can kind of play in the same uh, playground, if you will, of the, the basic human movements, like a bilateral squat, single leg training, bilateral hip hinge, upper body, you know, push, pull, so on and so forth. So this, um, this caught my attention a couple of years back after seeing so much of the Nordic hamstring curl stuff and then kind of seeing some of this in research. And I'm one of those people who I, I look at research and also anecdotal experience as equals. The research is awesome. It's important. It's, it's good to kind of use it as a guide, but it's also important to kind of go into your own lab, AKA the gym and try things out and see if, if they can be effective. And what we found just anecdotally in the past few years of being open at our facility is that this is one of those exercises where it can be pretty beneficial 
when applied in the right setting for the right reasoning. This kind of goes back to, you know, my, my thinking is that we have to stop falling in love with exercises, rather fall in love with adaptations. So this exercise could be one of many that could work, but for the right person at the right time with the right goals and the right injury history, this could be really great. And I, um, I kind of wanted to play this series out. So I actually shot, I actually shot these videos this morning, <laughs> coincidental. And um, I will be posting this on my Instagram, kind of a progression series of the reverse Nordic curl or the, you know, the tall nail fallback. Mm -hmm. So people can kind of see, okay, where do I start? Where do I go? And how to kind of, how do I build from there? Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's, uh, you know, stay on this too. We, in New Hampshire, sure. when I, I thought you had a, a, an exercise, it was called the medicine ball elevated long bridge ISO with sprinter mm -hmm. ISO and pullover ISO. But basically it looked like, yeah, <laughs> it looked like, uh, it really just looked like a, um, you know, a, a knees to chest lying down, you know, but you were off yeah. of, you were off of the ground. So just give us sure. an idea. Like, so you're on the ground, your feet are elevated. You drive up almost into a straight leg bridge position, but the one knee is in a, you know, kind of towards the chest. It just looks like you're running, but we put you down on the ground horizontally. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and is this ISO idea for you with this whole uh, system really kind of going back to this tissue tolerance is this why you're doing it that's exactly correct i look at it this so and the way you just worded the position is absolutely perfect it's like that's that's money it's spot on so i i look this kind of goes back to one of those five key areas and people often like okay nordic hamstring curl uh, slider hamstring curl crx yeah you're getting the the muscle belly like the mid belly for the most part of the hand yeah you'll get some of the insertion points and proximal points but we often don't stay in this long bridge or the research talks about long arc or hamstring bridge or like you said straight leg bridge same thing where the knee the the working knee is only bent a little bit or like five to ten degrees of knee flexion versus having your heel to your butt like in a regular bridge now uh, drive your heel aggressively down to, into the ground or the elevated surface like six or twelve inches off the ground and then raise your hips up you should feel your high hammy ache and also your proximal hamstring tendon, uh, tendon be working. And I like to start things in an isometric fashion, kind of like you just alluded to, tissue tolerance, loading tolerance, whether it's the structural support stuff like the ligaments or the tendons or just the muscles getting used to it. And yes, you, if, you, if you don't train hammies and you don't train this position, you will likely feel a little bit of cramping in the, in the, the high hammy. And that's completely okay. That's completely fine. But there's a lot of good research out there talking about you know doing emg studies and all this type of things where this is one of those medium intensity exercises that could fit perfectly before some of the high intensity protocols like you would see in a nordic hamstring curl or even like a dumbbell a, a bilateral so two leg dumbbell rdl where you're directly loaded so i love this position because the working leg i'm getting that high hand to that proximal hand isometrically the other knee that's kind of driven, like you alluded to, Ant, driven toward the chest, I'm getting that hip flexor. So now I'm getting a double whammy at uh, two out of those five spots. And then I, I, we could play around with the hand position. Do I want to have a dumbbell press above my chest for some shoulder and, and chest work? Do I want to have a medicine ball or dumbbell kind of behind my head to really increase uh, relative stiffness or anti-extension moment arm on the core? We could really play around from there, but I'm getting two out of the five that I'm trying to attack or address from a lower body kind of injury reduction performance and answer standpoint, I'm very happy with right now as a coach. So I like this a lot. Um, you can even simplify it in, you know, just lay flat on the ground. You have no, uh, no objects. You have no dumb, dumb, no medicine ball, nothing. And just slightly bend both knees, drive the heels aggressively into the ground, prop the hips off the ground, drive your toes towards your face, press your palms into the ground, and boom, you get bilateral uh, loading of the proximal hamstring tendon. And again, this is one of those exercises where we, we don't really see how to kind of dial back a Nordic hamstring curl. Because it, it has become so popularized, people often forget, okay, I don't know someone who can really just jump in and do that. How do I regress and kind of back off and build toward that eventually? This is a great way to do it. The hamstring or long arc or long lever or straight leg bridge is a great way to begin to load some of those areas. Absolutely. And so we'll finish up this piece of, of this conversation with, with this is really, you were talking about time under tension and uh, just kind sure. of uh, finish 
conclude this with the, the tension is your friend idea. Why is tension our friend in this in this specific case? So King Tut, I mean, you know, time under tension, I've always thought of it that way. It is really important for the benefit of mastering position. So positional capacity, right? So, you know, Dr. Tim Gabbett, uh, you know, he, he has a ton of good work on the acute to chronic workload ratios and all that type of stuff. But he talks about, uh, I may be butchering the quote, but he talks about it's not the load that breaks you down. It's the load that you're not prepared for. So if we don't prepare athletes to own positions, right, to master the ability to have capacity in certain positions, how can we then ask them to not only load those positions, but then load them through full ranges of motion, full joint excursions in sport and athletic endeavors. So I love uh, time and attention, tempo work, eccentric, isometrics, because what it does is, is it forces someone to slow down. For example, right, take your... Let's say you have a 15-year-old young boy, uh, basketball player, comes to the facility. He's loosey-goosey. He's super flexible and mobile, but he, he lacks the adequate level of motor control to maintain position, right? Like you put him, let's, let's, let's pop a you know, 10-pound dumbbell, 15-pound dumbbell at each hand, have him do a split squat, right? He plops down, he smacks the ground with his knee, comes back up, does it again. You're like, okay, let's slow that down. Give me a three-second eccentric. Well, my thought process is, you know what? No, let's actually give them a specific tempo where it's, let's say, five seconds down, five seconds up. Because you, you and I both know, if I say five seconds down, five seconds up, that's going to be like two or three seconds down, two or three seconds up. <laughs> so I'll, I'll always opt for the higher number. Because if I say three seconds, they're like, yeah, screw you, I'm doing one second. So my, my goal is to, you know, piss the athlete off in such a way where it's forces them to slow down. I say piss off in a funny way, not in the real way. I want them to slow down and control their positions, right? I want you to show me that you have the adequate qualities developed and built to control positions. What are sports? Sports ultimately are self-organization, right? Body awareness, your ability to get into a position, to produce force in that position, all of these wonderful expressions of, of athleticism and quality and skills. Well, you can't produce all of these forces and these skills and do all these wonderful things in sport and athletic endeavors if you first cannot control the position and master tempo and slow things down and you be in control of that. And so I look at tension, whether you want to talk about the law of the radiation, upper body work with kettlebells, I mean, those are wonderful uh, things to talk about. But then just understanding that tension can be your friend from an internal tension standpoint and how you can use that tension to master position and build capacity in positions. For example, because I'm sure you want something applicable, let's talk about a wall sit. And we kind of alluded to that earlier, Neil, but a wall sit allows you, okay, I'm going to control my ability to maintain a knee flex position roughly 90 degrees for let's call it 30 seconds. Do that for a phase, then maybe next phase you load it up with a goblet in front of you, then the next phase, you know what? Let's actually do a, goblet, a dumbbell goblet box squat. Now you can control that range of motion because you spent enough time there to build capacity. Absolutely. And that would be the next step, right? Is like you, we, we built that yep. foundation. And then in your article, you were even talking about, you gave us some examples of some basic level deceleration exercises. So those mm -hmm. are going to come first, right? These exercises kind yeah. of building that foundation. And now we're doing things like uh, you talk about drop squat, drop lateral squat, drop squat to stick. Talk to us about just how you would progress and regress this piece of it. Sure. Yeah. So I look at the drop squat and some people call this snap downs. Essentially, you know, if you can envision an athlete just standing there, right? Standing there, feet are hip width apart, like all good. From there, it's got to be a, you know, kind of a progressive movement where only raise the heels off the ground. Let the toes stay glued to the ground. Reach your hands up for that imaginary rebound. And then use your arms to create some speed and velocity and drop down as quick as possible and stick that landing in that bottom squat position. Arms should be behind you. That kind of overload position of where you, you're, I want you to slow down fast. And someone says, like, Coach, what are you talking about? Well, wouldn't you speed up fast? That's acceleration. We're doing the opposite, deceleration. I want you to slow down fast. If you conceptualize, think about like, okay, how do I conceptualize that? 
it makes sense in terms of we want this to be crisp the same way I, I would want you to do a non-counter movement jump really quickly and then stick it, right? So drop squat or snap down, some people call it, that's kind of the first landing point in a, in a, in a you know, in a, uh, a simple way to start that. Then let's get out of that plane of motion and let's go to some side-to-side stuff or in the frontal plane because most often we spend time in that sagittal plane, forward and backward. Let's get out of it for a moment. Let's get into the, the frontal plane, so side to side, left to right, and do a drop lateral squat. What that is, it's the same exact thing. The only difference is now your feet are as wide as they would be if you were to do a, you know, a dumbbell goblet or a kettlebell goblet lateral squat. And, and then you raise both heels. You're just going to jut into or sit into rather one of those hips where one knee uh, at the bottom is bent and the other leg is nice and long and straight. And so I really believe that we have to address both of these uh, planes of motion. And you could even play around with some transverse and do some rotational variations if you'd like to. But I think these two are, are where I like to start because they're simple, to, they're to the point, and it addresses two, of, two out of three really important planes of motion. And then you just progress them by, at, you kind of just layer things in very slowly. I'm, I'm a big fan of a slow cook training approach. I don't like to rush the, the process. I like to take our time, especially when I talk about we talk about long-term athletic development um, with, you know, uh, youth athletes, high school athletes, college athletes, and potentially even semi or professionals. And then even with our, our gen pop or our adult population, we pepper in a ton of drop squat stuff, especially if someone's saying, hey, look, I really, I'm going to be winter skiing this winter, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing playing some pickup basketball. Well, we want to prepare them, right? We want to make sure that they're ready to accept those forces and loads Let's work in some of these D cell mechanics first and foremost, because technically, if acceleration falls under the athletic development or plyometric department of your warm up or of your of, or of your extended warm up, well, shouldn't deceleration uh, qualities and skills fall under there as well? I would say yes. So, uh, you know, big fan of putting in some of the drop squat work or drop lateral squat, and then you kind of just would go progressively from the next phase. You know, where you add in a stick. If you add in a two stick or add it a width stick. The only difference is, so if you do that drop squat variation, whereas in the first level drop squat itself, only the heels leave the ground for a moment. In the drop squat to stick, your toes also leave the ground, but it's not a matter of let me jump and then stop. It's raise your heels up, reach for that imaginary rebound, let the toes leave the ground just for a millisecond. And then again, slow down fast, create that over speed with the arms, a lot of velocity and really drive down and then stick that bottom landing. And again, we're just like you alluded to beautifully earlier in is we're building and we're layering in some tissue tolerance, some landing tolerance, some the ability to uh, absorb loads and forces. And this is some really important things for the long term. So is that what the stick is really doing? So the stick is really this mini jump basically. Right. Yes, exactly. And, and so exactly. that's just the next progression that uh, we're going to start to add a little bit of force for them, you know, obviously to build that uh, tissue tolerance while they're moving now. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Cool. That's exactly it. Yep. Awesome. Great stuff on that. Um, I'll remind everybody, did a whole presentation on that. It's on bodybyboyleonline.com and get some great articles and we'll point everybody in the right direction for those articles. But um, Matthew, let's move on to some um, communication stuff and the power of language. We, you know, Nick Winkleman came out with his book recently. We had him on. We all know yeah. how important that is. Uh, but it's obviously always great to get different viewpoints on this as well. And I liked what you were talking about in the article that you had you know, attack the low hanging fruit first, keep it simple, and most importantly, make it relatable. Let me, when you say attack the low hanging fruit, what do you, what exactly do you mean by that with, is that a, the, the easiest thing for somebody to understand or what is that? I think, you know, when it comes to communication, uh, some of the low hanging fruit is, you know, people don't utilize the skill of active listening first and foremost right and so that to me is it doesn't really require much else than just sitting there and listening right and so I, i'm a big fan of listening more talking less so let's let's use an example right so 
I'm going to text, hey, what's up, man? I, I, I pop in a text, yo, what's going on, man? How's everything going? Like, you know, how's, how are times right now? Boom. And now I'm going to sit there. I'm going to wait, right? Now I see the three little the three little dots, the thought bubble or the text bubble coming in. And, is, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's concocting a text. He's putting something together for me. And, and I'm just going to, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to wait patiently for him to respond. And then Ant responds, hey, man, nothing, you know, how's it going with you, X, Y, and Z. I'm going to think about what Ant said. I'm going to consider what he said. I'm going to, you know, take that and then conjoin it with my thoughts and what I was thinking about in terms of, and also what I want to respond with. And then I'll apply that information, use some critical thinking skills, and I'll send him a, a text response. That, to me, is akin to the skill of active listening. Whereas if I just, if I just already put together kind of an automated, pre-drafted text, and all of a sudden Ant, Ant replies, and boom, I hit him back a response, he's going to be like, wait a second, did he even review what I wrote? That, to me, is akin to hearing someone in one of the other ear. Two very different uh, ways to apply your ears, whereas one is you're actively engaging in conversation, you're showing them you care, you're displaying relatability, vulnerability, um, you're, you're allowing them to kind of have the microphone or take the floor, if you will. You're making eye contact. I mean, it goes much deeper than just verbal language, also body language. And so if you can do nothing else more and you want to really become good at communication, listen more, talk less. That, that to me is one of the lowest hanging fruits that people often don't really, uh, they don't exhibit that. And especially in today's society where everything's snap your finger, it's fast, it's go, go, go. I've actually been super grateful uh, for these past four or five months because it has, it has forced me to really slow things down, think more critically, and help to refine some of my communi communication skills, which is another reason why, one of the reasons why I wanted to, you know, I've had a, an online strength coach for six years, you know, his name is Greg Robbins, He's, he owns the strength coach um, in Worcester, Mass. I wanted to hire uh, a speaking coach, someone who can allow me to speak better, communicate better, and understand better from a professional standpoint. So we brought on, you know, like you and I had, had been alluding to earlier, someone who we're both fans of. I, I look at her as the absolute communication ninja is Jenny Reary. And so these are some of the things that we have talked about in our coaching sessions, but it, it, it's just you have to listen more, be more understanding, use eye contact, demonstrate vulnerability, kind of like uh, Brene Brown talks about um, in Daring Greatly, another phenomenal book that I recommend everyone read. I'm going through it now uh, as an audio book. It's just how do I show the other person through my actions that I actually care about what they're saying? Yeah, it, it, I really, I'm, the Brene Brown books are awesome. And, and but yeah. The, there was a book that, and people who really listen to the podcast know, have heard me mention this book. It's called, uh, If I Understood You, Would I Have This Look on My Face? And it's from Alan mm -hmm. Alda. And people might remember Alan Alda from, he was uh, Hawkeye on, in MASH. And yeah. what he really talked about was, you know, you talk, you say, you mentioned this a little bit too, is there's so many distractions right now, and especially in the gym, when you're coaching, it, it can be hard, you know, to, to, to focus on, mm -hmm. on one thing sometimes, but um, it, it's this idea about just really dropping everything else and really being present. And what he is doing is using improv as a way to teach people how to do this because in improv, and it's not just improv, isn't just for comedy, but uh, it's, so it's, mm -hmm. it's about, being there in that moment. And so I'll give an example. Again, people have heard me talk about this is that I did not prepare for this interview until three o'clock. So we got on the phone at four and I didn't start preparing until four. I had a plenty of time to do that. I, I got looked at a couple of your articles. I listened to some of your stuff. And I don't want to over prepare. I know it sounds funny, but mm -hmm. I want to get just enough to say, let me throw this out. Let me have him expand on this to, uh, to, to really understand what he's talking about right now. And listen, it forces me to listen. I always say, if I'm not scared going into an interview, something's going the interview is not going to be good. And I think yep. you can relate this with, uh, with, with coaching by just listening to the kids, understanding, be there, you mentioned this as well in something in one of the articles when when they were saying, you know, you, there's there's a few different ways this can happen. It could say, I want to have 
um, a stronger uh, legs. You know, I just want to have stronger legs or stronger, stronger knees, better knee health. But sure. then somebody else could would come in and say, oh, I really want to have better knees because I want to be uh, playing baseball and I want to be faster. I'm, I'm trying to be the best steal, base stealer there is and I need to improve my speed. So you're getting so much more information from athlete too. Mm-hmm. But if you listen mm-hmm. more, you'll get that information eventually as you build. And you have to do that. It's an active uh, it's, it's an active conscious process. So that's why I just wanted to elaborate yeah. personally more on that. Cause I do love that. You said that in the article, listen more talk. I said, it's so important. Um, and that being said, I need to be quiet here and let you talk a little bit more. Um, so, uh, no, no, you're, I'm you're kidding. Spot on. I mean, Ma- yeah, no, you're spot on with the conscious, the consciousness too. I mean, you know, we've seen like Nick Wickleman came out with his book, right. And we, we saw, uh, a couple of years back, Brett Bartholomew come out with a national uh, Amazon bestseller, and so conscious coaching. And so I, you know, I 100% agree with you. So much so to the point where um, I, I'm fortunate enough now to be teaching uh, that exact class. So Brett Bartholomew's class was built and designed at Maryville University. It's an online course for undergraduate students, and I stand by that thought wholeheartedly because. Young up and coming coaches, healthcare uh, professionals, and fitness professionals, and practitioners, they need a massive skill of communication. The art and the science of what we're talking exercise science, X and O's of program design, they're awesome. The anatomy is awesome. But if you cannot properly communicate with someone and use conscious on the floor coaching, then how can you build that trust and that buy and How can you build that rapport with them? And so I, I agree with you 100%. It's so important to be conscious. Yeah, and, and you, you kind of summed it up when you were talking about understand the athlete, not just mm-hmm. the goal. Because if you just hear, I want stronger legs or strong, better, I want my knees to be to function better, that doesn't really, you don't really know how to get, how to fix that always. You, you, can't, you mm-hmm. can't personalize what you're doing if you don't, really understand the athlete so i I love that piece of it and i think that that goes in line with what you were talking about nick winkman was the first one that opened my eyes to this he involved the athlete in the process and he was talking about giving autonomy to the athletes talk expand on involving the athlete in the process and how we can do this because for a lot of coaches this is hard with eight ten twelve fifteen athletes in a group Mm-hmm. I mean, it, this is this example is probably uh, overkill uh, for the high school uh, male athlete, right? In the in a group setting, right? In a group setting. Yeah. So co- he's like, "Yo, coach, like, I want it's the summertime. I'm trying to build a sweet pair of biceps, right?" And I'm a coach. And I'm like, "All right, well, let me think about that, right? Like, let me let me actually consider this. If I want my program to be evidence based and put this athlete in the best position possible to succeed and be healthy and perform well, you know, I can still keep the program like 95 to 98 percent evidence based, you know, systematic, our systematic approach, our philosophy, our loading schemes, and throw in some biceps, one or two exercises in the entire program for a phase or two, right? And ask yourself, right? How many exercises, I'm talking the recovery, the warm-up, the pliers, the development stuff, the strength, conditioning, are in one program, right? A two-day week program, you're looking at somewhere between 25 to 35 exercises. If I throw in one or two bicep curls, is it quote-unquote functional? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm not trying to have that argument. My point is, I want little Joey, who's asking me for a sweet pair of biceps since the summertime, to feel like he is a part of the process and not just another number. And so I'm like, yeah, Joey, I got you, man. Like, let me let me add this in for you, and let's let's make it quote unquote functional. I'm putting him in a tall nail position, one of those developmental positions, right? So I win, he wins, we all win, and that's that's kind of what I, I believe Nick was alluding to as well. Is let's involve them, let's let's ha- let's allow them to have some autonomy, and feel like they are part of something bigger, versus saying, oh yeah, I go to coaching sessions, you know, a couple of days a week with like ten other players, and yeah, I don't know the coach's name. Yeah, I think sometimes too we were talking about this like you can even sneak it in with make them think like they 
they came up with the idea. Almost be like, okay, you can do the curls, but we're going to finish up with some uh, little squat with curls. So squat first into exactly. a curl, squat curl, you know, like get something exactly. else in there. And like, you can either do squat curls or, you know, get on the, uh, do something else or whatever. So give them, yeah. give them a choice of two exercises and, and, and that you want that you wouldn't mind them doing, but allowing them that choice. So, um, mm-hmm. and man, let's, uh, let's finish up this piece with uh, just this idea about body language, uh, what, mm-hmm. because I think this is a misunderstood piece. And, and you know, whether they're kids or not, they can read what how we're feeling, our energy as well. Talk to us about body language. So this is key, right? So I want you to envision, let's talk about one of the most winningest coaches of all time one of the most highly respected coaches of all time. I'm not talking about Bill Belichick. I love Bill Belichick. Past fan to the death, but I know people have their, their feelings about him. I'm talking about Coach K. Mike, you know, Coach K, Duke men's basketball. I think, and also USA men's basketball for several, several uh, Olympics. Can you pronounce his last name? Krzyzewski? No, there you go. I couldn't. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, 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 look, I had to look it up. Uh, but so, you know, Coach K is someone who's highly revered. He's respected. Go to Google, right? Type in a picture of Coach K. He has these eyes where he, he like is in laser focus with the player or the player that he's talking to. It's amazing. You'll never sit there and say, yeah, Coach K kind of posts and puts his eyes down. And talk. No, he looks you directly in the eyeball. And that to me, like, that right there, boom, that's one sign of body language. He is saying, hey, I'm being attentive. Well, how can I support? What, what is the need? How can I fulfill the need? That to me, like there's so much power there. But then he goes above and beyond. He has an open hand position. So I'm not sitting here saying, well, if you cross your arms in front of you or if you put your hands behind your back, those aren't bad things at all. There's no such thing as bad or good. It's more of, well, you know, what is the the specifics? And and unfortunately, it depends. His hands are in this kind of open position. And Jenny talks a lot about this from a presentation standpoint. Jenny Rierick, where are your hands? Are they actively engaged? Are Are your fingers open or are you clenching your fists? Are your hands crossed in front of your, your, your chest or are they kind of down by your sides and it's open, kind of conveying, hey, I'm open, hey, I'm vulnerable, hey, I'm relatable, hey, I'm with you. And that's really critical from a, a body language reading standpoint because you, you said it. Whether, whatever the age of the client, older, younger, you know, a kid, they're not dumb. They can read these things without a word having to be said. That's why it's body language. And the other thing is, you know, is there this, like a concerted effort look on their face. Like, okay, they literally are looking at me like, I want to help you. I want to be here. Or what did you say? I would like to listen to you. So that's in me. Those are some examples of helpful or positive body language. I don't like to play the whole good, bad game or the, you know, the green check, the red X. I don't, I don't kind of play that game. I'm not against it, but I just think that, well, one is beneficial. One is, is not as beneficial. It's almost like nutrition, right? Like, well, it's not good or bad for you. It's like this could be more beneficial. This could be less beneficial. Yeah. So on the on the on the less beneficial side, let's say you're walking into a club. Twenty five year old uh, uh, version of Matt and version of Aunt are walking to a club. NYC. Boom. Here we go. We're single. We're we're, we're gonna get out. It's gonna be awesome. There's a bouncer right there, right? All black shirt, all black pants. Big big guy. Clearly lifts weight. A pair of center shades on. All black. Mean mug, facial expression, arms crossed in front of his chest, looking at you, looking at you like he doesn't care about you at all. You're gonna be like, uh, okay. You might feel intimidated. You might feel okay. This guy's body language is kind of creeping me out a little bit. He's not welcoming. He's not showing relatability or vulnerability or or, or someone who you're gonna be like, yeah, I'm gonna go out of my way to talk to that guy. So, and or he may even have his hands in his pocket, which could potentially display a, a level of carelessness. Like, ah, this guy's really care at all or sometimes you'll see on the coaching floor where a coach you know maybe they lie down on the floor or maybe they lean against equipment or maybe they kind of you know they're kind of leaning against the wall or, or like you know maybe one hand in the pocket other hand you know maybe on their head like where it just doesn't show with their body that they actually care or they're actually even there or they're pr- not even present and so these are some things where may not be as beneficial if you're trying to, again, build buy-in, build trust for that yeah. coach-to-athlete relationship. Yeah, and, you know, just staying on the um, on the bar example, 
it's funny because I worked at a bar that it was a music bar and on the way the owners didn't want a big guy to be at the front door. So because they felt like that that symbol of this big angry guy dressed in black was going to create tension in the room because that does happen. Like somebody comes up like, Oh, look at this guy. He thinks he's tough. And there's only, maybe there's only him at the door. So we actually had like small regular guys at the door kind of (laughs) checking ID. We really didn't have, so it really created it was it was the first thing that you kind of came in, so it was this this experience that you had, and this bar was world famous blues bar, and people just absolutely they came from all over the world and they loved it, and I I always kind of bring that story up because I think it, it set the tone when you walked in, and I think body language uh, is something you know it doesn't mean the guy it was okay if the guy was big, it just didn't really like he didn't have that scowly you know they had to have some personality. They had to be friendly. They had to be uh, inviting and, you know, just to kind of and welcoming. Um, and, that, yeah. and that's the same thing that you're talking about. So uh, good stuff. I just had to bring that up because this reminded me of, of that mm-hmm. bar. It was called Manny's Car Wash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, awesome. It's a great, great uh, name of a bar. It is. It is. People loved it. Um, well, let's finish up really quick uh, with um, just this idea. I like, you know, look. People have to understand that you have, so you're talking about social media as an educational platform. And and we also have to remember that we have to use it to build our brand too. And it's an important piece. So we're kind of segueing this idea about communication into this. And, And this is an important part. Providing consistent value to people, that's what we always have to start out doing. You always have to provide that value. But it's crazy when people will say, how do you find, you know, your guests? Well, I can't find somebody if they're not out there, right? So if you don't have a YouTube channel, if you don't have an Instagram page, if, you know, you don't have, if you're not writing articles or speaking, in my book, Oh, the first one of the first people I interviewed for the book was obviously Coach Boyle. And uh, Mm -hmm. the idea for Be Like the Best came from Coach Boyle's interview when he had said, I attribute a lot of my success to writing articles and speaking. And I said, you know, let me remind everybody they should be like Mike. And they should start writing articles, whether that's on Facebook or uh, their own blog or start writing articles for plenty of the uh, the the uh, the online sites out there, and what you want to do is take those things, see the feedback you're getting, and start turning them into lectures, and then you know speak anywhere, workshops, clinics, lunch and learns, like you talked about, any free, mm-hmm. do for free. You start to build your communication skills, and you're starting to get out there, and it's really again where Coach Boyle had attributed a lot of his success came from writing and speaking. I just want you to talk about like now that you've been in the business for a while and you have, you know, interns and and young strength coaches are starting to ask you how to be successful. Talk to us about understanding social media, using it as an educational platform and providing value. Yeah, I think the biggest thing we often in here from let's say uh, a, a current student in undergrad in our field or even someone who's new to this field like an up, up and coming coach or a trainer where they say oh you know I, I've been wanting to do it uh, put an Instagram off but I still feel ready at it the same thing with the training nutrition I'm going to start on Monday and my, my response is whether it's an intern a staff mate or someone who's reaching out to me on Instagram or whatever social media platform these days is well, why, you know, what I say is, well, why haven't you started yet? Like, what is, what's holding you back other than the person in the mirror? Because if you're going to sit there and tell me that you're afraid that of what your peers will think, you're afraid to be wrong, you're afraid to make a mistake, you're afraid that it's not going to be the best solution. Well, I would say, well, have you ever tried and failed? Well, that's how you learn to become better. You apply new knowledge. And the other thing is, KYP, know your personnel, know the person you're trying to deliver the or convey the message to. Because if I'm trying to put, put a post out for another professional or colleague of mine, 
I'm missing the point of social media. Social media, in my opinion, if you're trying to use it as an educational platform is put out the message and the content to your audience, speak their language. That's how you'll build buy-in, you'll build trust, you'll build relatability, you'll build vulnerability. And they'll say, oh, you know, like he's actually speaking my language or she's speaking my language versus speaking over my head using all this sciencey jargon. I'm not going to, I'm not, you know, saying the scientific information is, is, is bad or wrong, but you have to learn how to take it and twist it in such a way that you still, it still is proper and correct for the literature, for the science, but you're also conveying it in a way that is digestible and understandable and it's palatable for it. It's kind of a bite-sized um, piece where it's like versus oh my god I have to look at this 20 page research article you know my name is Tom and I'm a 40 year old accountant I don't know what the heck this is right like speak to the 40 year old accountant named Tom who's been working nine to five just got home had dinner with his kids and has like 30 minutes to, to, to scour the interwebs if you will and you want to pop up on his feet to say wow like this person put an Instagram post out the colors are pretty inviting it's, it's a light blue and a white the title says hamstring strength okay very simple that's uh, oh four exercises boom a small list of exercises oh there's a video for each it's 15 seconds or less and there's a small little write-up the size of uh, you know maybe something that will fit into four to six sentences oh wow this is really simple digestible and it only took me five minutes oh wow i'm going to go back to this person's page and that's how i look at social media a young up-and-coming coach or student everyone's afraid oh we're we'll talking to you guys talking to good do you know how many uh, renditions of my page I've went through? And I still are, uh, am trying to find ways and patterns and things that will come off as more appealing and simple. That's the key. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, you know, one of uh, uh, Mike's favorite things to say, and I firmly believe it, is, is how can I make something more simple? How can I make it so simple that anyone around the world, fitness and non-fitness related, can understand what I'm saying and utilize and apply this information yeah. because if, if the answer is no to any of your content for that, then, well, why are you doing it? You have to have a reason as to why you're doing it. So, you know, I, I think having a social media platform and using it educationally is really important. And that lends itself to a YouTube channel, right? Where you have videos. So this morning, you know, I shot those videos kind of like I was alluding to earlier, the tall, the tall new fallback. I have five progressions. So that, that will be kind of packaged up, if you will, into an upcoming Instagram post when I get around to it this week or next week. Uh, and then I'll also upload those five videos to my YouTube channel. So now it has multi-use. I could also, if I wanted to, put those uh, videos or some of them into an article or a blog. That's the third usage. And I could also use those in a presentation, which I plan on doing at a phone presentation, um, whether it's in an article, whether it's uh, you know part of a presentation like a video they can watch inside i could also use some of those videos when i'm uh, teaching at an undergraduate level as an adjunct professor at two of the schools i teach at i can also implement some of those videos if it's an exercise training based course so now that those videos have five or six different uses and that's how you are also efficient in this educational model with social media and i think that's the way you win is because you're constantly providing value in a, mul a multitude of outlets and avenues. Absolutely. And you really do, you know, KYP, know your personnel, like you said, know your demographic, because if you're trying to sell a fat loss program, stop worrying about mm -hmm. what, you know, Coach Boyle or Eric Cressy or Al Vermeil would think, right? You're trying to sell to those people. Unless you're trying to sell the trainers, that's a different story. Sure. Um, but you, you know, you really do. You have to know, stop worrying about what your peers, what your mentors think about that language sometimes. Cause I think we get, I've been guilty of it myself is, you know, we worry about what, what are the other people in the industry going to think of me? And it's really not, uh, it really doesn't matter. That's not going to put food on the table as long as you're, you know, obviously you still want to have integrity, but you have to remember that, sure. you know, people respond differently in your demographic. So, but, um, mm -hmm. Matthew, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming on. Like I said, it's been long overdue. Um, I'll give everybody the links to 
Uh, some of the articles like deceleration and landing mechanics, skills and athletic performance, and some of the communication articles that people can go to. And a reminder that this presentation was on bodybyboyonline.com. So, Matthew, thank you again so much for coming on and talking about uh, all these great topics. Anthony, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for having me on. It's been, it's been a really fun uh, time. So thanks again. All right, that's going to do it for episode 293 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days, just a buck. You'll have all the access to videos, articles, and programs, as well as the best form on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, the free summer seminar series continues. I am actually going this Thursday, 2 o'clock, but there's presentations Monday through Friday into September um, at 2 o'clock every day Eastern time. There's live presentations with Q&A sessions right after. Check that out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Matthew Ibrahim for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Thanks to Luke Summers and Train Heroic. Don't forget, Coach Boyle and I use Train Heroic to deliver all of our online training. Head over to trainheroic.com to start your free 14-day trial. Thanks to Jarlyn Coopersmith and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. My name is Anthony Renna. You can check all my stuff out at continuefit.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.